Uh, today's uh, meeting is on per perspectives on transference, and I just told Mark Soames, who's sitting here, that I didn't realize transference was so popular. And he said, well, it's because it's ubiquitous. <laughs> transference is a little bit like the magic bullet in psychoanalysis. So I uh, expect an interesting uh, round table today. And I will introduce the participants uh, in alphabetical order, so I would appreciate if you would raise your hand when your name is mentioned. Uh, first is Charles Brenner. He's training and supervising analyst at the New York Psychoanalytic Institute, past president of the American Psychoanalytic Association, author of numerous articles and several books, the most recent of which is Psychoanalysis or Mind and Meaning, and he's also a highly regarded supervisor of mine from some years ago now. Norman Deutsch is a psychiatrist, training analyst, researcher, essayist, and poet. He's on the research faculty at Columbia University Center for Psychoanalytic Training, Training and Research, and at the University of Toronto. A four-time winner of Canada's National Magazine Gold Award, he's the author of the recently released the brain that changes itself. Walter Freeman is professor of molecular and cell biology at the University of California at Berkeley. He's a Guggenheim Fellow and the, re and the recipient of the Helmholtz Award and the Pioneer Award from the Neural Network Council. He is the author of Society of Brains, a study in the neuroscience of love and hate and how brains make up their minds. Oh. Arnold Model is training and supervising analyst at the Boston Psychoanalytic Society and Institute and clinical professor of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School. He is a practicing psychoanalyst and the author of five books, the latest of which is Imagination and the Meaningful Brain. Bradley Peterson is Suzanne Crosby Murphy Professor in Pediatric Neuropsychiatry and Director of Neuropsychiatry Research at Columbia University. He is also the Research Coordinator of the Philoctetes Center. Thank you. Dr. David Pincus, uh, who is going to moderate today, uh, is the Director of the Mind Brain Consortium at Summa Hospital of Akron. He is in private practice, a member of the Cleveland Psychoanalytic Center, and the fa on the faculties of Newcom, Case Western Reserve University, and the Medical University of South Carolina. He sits on several editorial boards and has published articles and chapters on topics pertaining to the interface of mind and brain. His latest article is co-authored with Walter Friedman and Arnold Model, entitled The Neuro Neurobiological Model of Perception, Considerations for Transference. He is also a past participant of roundtables at the Philoctetes Center. Dr. Pincus. Oh. Uh, there are books written by the participants of this roundtable today outside, so those of you who want to purchase them, please do, and I'm sure they would be happy to sign them for you. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. Thanks. So uh, Ed suggested uh, a few minutes before that we uh, begin our conversation by going around the room uh, amongst the discussants and each of us giving uh, some of our ideas about transference. and. Each of us, though, has read the paper that myself and Walter Freeman and Arnold Modell have written, and uh, we have all sort of worked off of that paper, but we don't want to be held to that paper, and certainly not to be held to that paper because none of you in the room have read it, so you cannot refer to it. So uh, my job is in some way to tell you in two lines or less what that paper is about, and then say a few things about uh, my, my previous experiences in trying to talk about transference, and then open up the conversation to our panelists and uh, 
and then eventually to you in the last half an hour to the, to the, to the group. It was, uh, the, the, the round table came about because I had sent the paper to Ed and to Francis. And it was no su real surprise to me that uh, they very quickly wanted to have a round table about it because most people want to talk about transference. And uh, perhaps it is, as Mark suggests, because it's ubiquitous. But it's also because uh, it seems as if nobody quite knows how to define it or what it is, even though it is ubiquitous. Um, analysts and therapists are all familiar with it, or at least anybody with a psychoanalytic background. And uh, there are many things about it that are in dispute. Uh, some people consider transference something that is pathological, and others think of it as something that is universal and part of our ongoing social realities. Other people view transference as something that can be made conscious, and others believe that transference is foundational and unconscious to human communications and really can never become something that is conscious. It is something that we can reflect upon, but not something that we can ever really be conscious of in the moment. Um, in our paper, uh, just to refer to it very briefly, our model of transference is that it is unconscious, that it is a part of all human perception, and that it is something that is integral to the way in which we situate and find ourselves in the world. Uh, in its pathological forms, it desituates us and keeps us held to imagos of the past and to our adaptations of events gone by and times gone by and feelings gone by. And in its healthy forms, it gives us a means of finding ourselves in our current worlds in, and we find in others memories and experiences of others from our past, even though we're not conscious of it. And it is a way for us to, in its healthier forms, for, for, for us to situate ourselves in our social worlds. We've linked our model neurobiologically to the work of Walter Freeman, who had initially studied olfaction in rabbits and cats, and uh, his study of neurodynamics has extended to other creatures and to other uh, modes of, of sensation and perception as well. I think that those are the two long sentences that describe what it is our paper is about. It's universal. Uh, we link it to a neurobiological model of human perception, human social perception and that it's unconscious. And also that we define transference as uniquely human. And uh, this is very much Arnold Modell's uh, significant input to our paper because of human's capacity for language and metaphor that enriches uh, our elaboration of our previous experience in a way that other animals, to our knowledge, are not able to do. And so with that as a very, very general background to what our paper is about, I'll transition. How did I do, Ed? Oh, good. Thank you. Um, and and um, I'll just say that um, when I've tried to give talks about transference before, it quickly regresses into definitions of terms and uh, arguments as to whether it's conscious, unconscious, this, that, the other thing. And uh, my job will be in some ways to encourage as much conversation and dialogue as is possible, and yet uh, at the same time not end up in a free-for-all about uh, what we all think it is. Um, in experimental psychology and neurobiology, I'll just say a few things about uh, models that have been equated or uh, have thought to be equivalent in some way or reduced to things that we think of as transference. Uh, 
some people have, have called it emotional expectancy. Others have talked about priming, emotional memory. Other people have talked about right brain laterality, social cognition. And some people have used the model, uh, model of kindling from uh, epilepsy research as a way of thinking about transference, that emotional kindling occurs that somehow carries us forward into our current environments. So uh, with those as uh, uh, something of a backdrop, I'd like to go around to our panelists and uh, ask each of you, and I'll, I'll start with uh, whoever would like to begin. I'll look around and see whose eyes meet mine first. <laughs> and, um, and, and you're free to take off from the paper or to also, I think, feel free to elaborate in whatever way you would like uh, about what is most significant for you uh, uh, about transference. Are there any eyes looking at me? Who would like to begin? Charles. Sure. Chuck. Should, right. I, should I have called you something else? So this is called, this paper was called, <coughs> excuse me, a neurobiological model of perception. Neurobiological model of perception and its relevance for transference, considerations for transference. This is a long and complex paper. My discussion is very brief. There are, after all, various ways of studying the functioning of the central nervous system. One is by studying the mind, as psychologists and in particular psychoanalysts do, because mind is one aspect of central nervous system functioning. Another way is by studying chemical and electrical phenomena, like brain waves. There are others, but these are the two with which this paper is concerned. So what are the main points the authors seem to me to want to make? First, that they have demonstrated that present perception is determined by past perception. The present is always influenced by the past. When it comes to central nervous system functioning of the sort involved in what everybody calls transference, whatever that means. Second, that transference is not just limited to the relationship between patient and analyst. It's a ubiquitous phenomenon, therefore, and is determined by previous experience. Those are the two principal points as I understood them. Now, I fully agree with both these statements. Alo wrote about the first, that is the influence of the past on present perception back in 1969. And I've written at length about the second, mind in conflict elsewhere. But I do have some points of difference that I think are important enough for me to uh, mention them. As I understand it, as I read it, the authors consider transference to be uniquely important in psychoanalytic therapy. For example, the abstract of the paper says, I quote now, transference is a key concept in psychoanalysis distinguishing the analytic technique from other forms of psychotherapy, end quote. The section of the paper that's labeled discussion and conclusion begins with this quotation. The theatrical and dramatic operation by which healing takes place or does not take place has a name, transference. So according to the authors, transference is the theatrical and dramatic operation by which healing takes place. Now that second, of course, echoes Strachey's dictum, one he made many years ago, that only a transference interpretation produces truly analytic improvement. Has to be an interpretation of a transference, according to Strachey. Now that's a dictum that many colleagues agree with to this day. 
I'm not one of them. I disagree with it. I believe that the principal aim of analytic therapy is not to analyze transference. Principal aim. The principal aim, I believe, is to discover and to help the patient become aware of the conflicts and compromise formations resulting from those conflicts that are responsible for the troubles that have brought the patient to seek help. So it's conflicts in general, not the transference alone or primarily. In my opinion, that's what analysis is all about. And in carrying out this task, an analyst uses, or I believe should use, every available source of information. Among these sources are the thoughts, feelings, and behavior that the patient has about the analyst, that is, the transference, as Freud defined it. When they're analyzable, they're a valuable source of information about the patient's conflicts, but no more and no less than any other source of information. They don't, so to speak, have a privileged position in analytic work therapy. Fantasies and so on about the analyst aren't always the best source of information about a patient's conflict. Sometimes they are, and then it's very useful to analyze them, but sometimes they're not. And in those cases, it's not useful to analyze them. Sometimes they interfere with the conduct and progress of the treatment. As Freud said, sometimes they cause a resistance to the treatment. In such cases, that's back 1912, in such cases, it's also important to analyze, that is, understand them. But sometimes they're an aid rather than a hindrance to the progress of analysis, and sometimes they're not the best source of the information an analyst is after. To summarize, they don't necessarily take preference. There's one other thing that is essential to be aware of and to keep in mind, in my opinion. The conflicts that persist throughout life and that are ubiquitous in mental functioning, I believe, are conflicts over the pleasure-seeking wishes of childhood. Wishes that become indissolubly connected with fear and misery. Freud's term was anxiety. I don't think it's possible to discuss the phenomena called transference without including some discussion of the incestuous and aggressive wishes and fantasies of early childhood. That expresses my hope for one, at least, direction of the uh, discussion. Thank you very much. Any comments? Or shall we go on with other comments at this point? I think, I think if we uh, talk about Charlie's comments, it will take us off track because we get into the varying opinions of what works in psychoanalysis, which isn't, isn't really what, what we're here to talk about. Oh, it's in the paper. <laughs> That's why I talked about yeah, it. Okay. That's fine. Uh, well. Actually, the, the main point that you were referring to was from the, a quotation at the beginning of our discussion section, I believe, from Deleuze. And, yes, uh, yes. Uh, I'm responsible for including it. I'm not sure that I entirely, oh, I entirely <laughs> agree with it either, but uh, that's okay. Okay, where else do we want to go? I would say that uh, I agree with Charles in two respects. One is <clears throat> the enormous role that's played by the past in experiencing and interpreting the present. And further, that this includes, incorporates, these vivid experiences. What? Hmm? Includes what? The past, the record, the record oh. of the past, includes all of the incestuous desires, the fantasies that you've alluded to, 
I would say that uh, from my perspective of how I got into to this, it's from a premise, a conclusion, which I drew from the chemical and electrical fields, which you alluded to, studying these fields. In very simple experiments in vision, hearing, touch, olfaction, to ask what does the cortex do, the sensory cortex, when it gets a stimulus? And overwhelmingly, the answer is that the cortex uses a small sample from sensory receptors, a whiff, a whisper, a glimpse, face in a crowd, uses that to construct a pattern which essentially is retrieved from the background store. Now this pattern is not invariant with the stimulus. You present the stimulus over and over, yes, you get the same pattern. But now when you change its significance, you get a new pattern. And furthermore, all the other patterns in the animal repertoire change. Now this is a conclusion which is at variance with virtually the entire history of Western philosophy. Plato and Aristotle both postulated the incorporation of forms. Descartes postulated the mathematization of input. The major continental philosophers followed suit. The only exception, two exceptions, one was St. Thomas Aquinas, 700 years ago, who recognized that there is nothing in the way of forms, of information, as we would call it, crossing into the brain. It is as immune to the introduction of foreign material as our immune system, which, as you know, will respond violently to introduction of material that it regards as foreign. This now led me to review studies of learning to see how does the person or the animal build this knowledge because the stimulus now essentially is activating some of the knowledge that the animal has. It's not a representation. It is a fragment of knowledge which the animal is going to use. And I came to the conclusion that this process of learning is endlessly divisive because everybody's experience is unique and it carries us further and further away from everyone else. And my favorite example is the graduate student syndrome, where the graduate student essentially dives in to a project and learns more and more about less and less and loses contact with the surround. I think that, in fact, this is not a bad model for some forms of autism and psychopathology. So the question is, on the one hand, it's unequivocal that brains have this immense power for learning, for adapting, for incorporating by action and understanding through assimilation, as Piaget described it. On the other hand, it's unquestionable that the evolution of the human species over the last three million years has been primarily social, the development of the social brain. How is it possible to reconcile these two principles. How is it possible now to have not just individual knowledge, but shared knowledge? And from this, then, and my readings 
in Pavlov and in William Sargent, The Battle for the Mind, and related texts, I realized that there is a process which we neurobiologists have been neglecting, which is the nature of affiliation, of bonding. And we can now identify the hormone. It's a nine-chain amino acid, oxytocin, that mediates now not learning, but the dissolving of past learning, allowing for now the formation of new learning. I think the most powerful single instance of this process at work is seen in adolescents who, for the first time, break their bond to their parents and form a new attachment to a loved one. They fall in love. That's catastrophic. <laughs> and we know that it's mediated by oxytocin. What happens now is not forgetting. It's a dissolving of bonds between child and parent as prelude to the child becoming a parent. And this is why it's so fundamental in mammalian evolution with the necessity for the caring for the altricial offspring that you have essentially a process here that is happening not just when you fall in love but in many other circumstances. Once you realize that this is going on, you see it in boot camp training, in corporate indoctrination, in teenage gangs, in church affairs. It's ubiquitous, just like transference. So this is the basis on which I view this opportunity to collaborate in essentially raising the question, what is the relationship between what you psychiatrists call transference and this phenomenon, which now I see as pervasive in human society? So that's why I'm here. Good. Well, welcome. Um, Norm, go yeah, ahead. So I'd like to pick up on that. Sure. Um, I think that Dr. Freeman's ideas about oxytocin and unlearning are, are staggeringly important and, and actually quite brilliant and I haven't been able to get them out of my head uh, since I first read them. Um, I've just finished a book on plasticity. So there is a chemistry for learning and we know a lot about that chemistry and how it happens and it turns out that there's a different chemistry for unlearning. I'm not sure at the state that we know absolutely for sure um, all the details about oxytocin and unlearning, but it's, it's just, I mean, I think it's a remarkably brilliant insight because what he's found is, look, as human beings, I, I'm being as presum presumptuous by reframing what you just said, but because we're plastic, and so much of our brains are plastic, including our perceptual apparatus, uh, and uh, we, we all see differently, we use different parts of our brains when we're seeing, we thought these maps were immutable, but they move around inside us, we tend to become idiosyncratic and experience the world very differently. But because we're social animals, we also need to somehow or other see it in the same way, especially if we want to cooperate. So he came, he basically pointed us towards this commitment uh, neuromodulator and then pointed out that there's this other literature about oxytocin where it's called an amnestic brain chemical to do with dissolving. Now, just to bring it right back to transference, uh, it seems like really, really important. We know that several things happen in transference. It there was a study done at the New York Psychoanalytic, I think about 25 years ago. Uh, this is picking up on Charles's point. And it showed that you don't have to have a full-blown transference neurosis analyzed to get better. Uh, many people who don't have that get better in analysis. But it also showed, yeah, there was a study. <laughs> you were thinking deep thoughts, but it was actually going on over a number of years by the New York wow. Psychoanalytic. It was an outcome 
study that was done. I proposed it. So. Yeah. Well, <laughs> someone was listening. Uh. Uh, it, it was published in the in the seventies and the in the eighties, but it also showed that if you had a transference neurosis, hmm. you actually made more progress than those who didn't. So. Look, this idea that analysts have had for a number of years that there can be something special about analyzing transference and that it can be important, I think was shown empirically to be the case. Now, if you link this up with Walter Freeman's ideas, what, what you see is that in the case of a close bonding, a commitment is formed, but there's a potential for dissolving. The reason he says we dissolve when we get together is because to cooperate we have to forego or give up our previous intentions to form new intentions. So the observation made not just in analytic treatments but in all treatments that there is uh, some kind of closeness with the therapist can facilitate change I think may be explained by your observation. I think it also explains something else which is that in therapy there is also an opportunity to do harm to the person because there's a kind of neuronal susceptibility. And if you think through patients, and I don't know if everyone shares this idea, but ever since I read it, it seems to me profoundly true that there's something about falling in love that leads to a kind of malleability. There's a malleability of the state of falling in love, uh, which is why parents are so concerned about who their children fall in love with, and why we say love is blind, and why a very self-possessed person can um, fall into the hands of someone who's very manipulative. And even though they're very self-possessed, they seem to s s get soft in the brain. And, uh, insane. Insane, okay. But <laughs> insane in, neuro in neuronal terms means that existing sane networks have been undermined or dissolved to a degree. And so... In no other terms. And, and I think in, sh yeah, and in shorter term therapies where it's more of a, a cognitive approach, you'll have some of this but less of it. So. Um, I mean, and the, the other issue I guess that this raises too is, you know, transferences tend to be very powerful. They tend to t tie into childhood experiences too, when important attachments are formed. And, you know, in thought through in terms of plasticity, uh, we know that most of the cognitive functions have what are called critical periods. Now, what a critical period is, is it just means that the brain is exceptionally plastic and you don't have to pay attention to change structure. It just changes. Children soak up language without an effort. Uh, later on, you can still learn a language, but you have to pay constant attention and it's very, very difficult. So the way I see this linking in is that obviously, I mean, we've known for years that oxytocin secretion is, is certainly at its height in the mother-child bonding and, and bonding with parents. Children have oxytocin. Uh, when they bond with their parents, it's not just parents with children and, uh, you know, lovers, lovers have it too. And then you set some kind of schema up uh, that becomes exceptionally attractive. And then what you're trying to do is rework that schema. So I, I find that exceptionally helpful. But I'll stop there except to tag something I hope we can return to, which is that Walter Freeman also has this other very brilliant arresting idea that, and I think he was describing it, which is, this. Look, most people think of transference as we have r mental representations in our head, images in our head based on the past that we transfer onto other people and if it's a good match we're doing well and if it's a bad match we think it's a problem or pathological, etc. But Walter Freeman's idea based on his work with uh, electrodes <laughs> in rabbits and studying exactly how the mind uh, learns to recognize things is that there are no representations in the brain. So this is another thing we just have to discuss here, that the notion of a mental representation or mental picture is simply a, a wrong-headed metaphor. And I'd love you to elaborate on that. Well, Arnie, why don't yeah, you say yeah, something I, I, about I'd like that. to pick, pick up on that point. I, th I think this is a very, very important issue. I think what Walter has proven is that what the neuroscientists call in information theory is totally wrong. And as it applies to psychoanalysis, I think uh, I, these ideas are, aren't current right now, but uh, so, some years ago, uh, the idea of the object uh, rep 
representation was, was very much in fashion. There were self-representations and object representations. And unfortunately, I think this came from uh, Freud's uh, uh, reading of John Stuart Mill, who in turn barred it from Locke. And uh, it, it, it is this old philosophy that there's something out there that we take in and, and there's a kind of mirroring inside. This is not how the mind works. This is not, not how transference works. I, I, I'd, like to, I'd like to also uh, uh, point up a, 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 another aspect of transference that, that we haven't talked about yet. And uh, that, uh, that is, <clears throat> the notion is not only transference is a selective idiosyncratic process, but it is a kind of em emulator of the future. Uh, the the uh, the idea of transference as a expectation uh, in terms of what will our my response do to the other uh, we, we run a kind of internal uh, uh, script as it were uh, to, to make this a little clearer I, I think Freud had had a sense of this in the notion of uh, uh, signal and anxiety uh, that we uh, uh, become anxious in terms of an impulse we have, and uh, which may be in conflict. Come, come back to Charlie's point about conflict uh, in terms of, of a future action. So that the, there is an aspect of transference that has to do with the future interaction we will have with the other in terms of what we are feeling at at, at this in, in instant in time. So in a sense, uh, transference is is a kind of uh, re, uh, uh, kind of uh, a simulator uh, of what might happen if 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 we act on on what 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 we are feeling. As a, it's kind of what I meant by the word of situating ourselves of the word expectancy, which was such a different twist on the way in which we've thought about transference. Brad, were you going to say something? Yeah, uh, it's. Um in a way, I'd like to respond to each, each of the um, previous comments, and, and I'll see if I can try to do it somewhat coherently. But maybe the jumping off point would be um, uh, Dr. Freeman's critique of, of information processing, which, forgive, for, for, forgive me if I'm wrong, but I, I, I think it's not as contemporary within um, current neuroscience as it, it I, I think it's a bit of a straw man taking an older view of information processing, which is that essentially we're passive recipients of stimuli, sensory stimuli, and in a bottom-up way, these th stimuli somehow combine and percolate into uh, creating a representation, a veridical re representation of external objects. That's, that's an old-fashioned view, and I think contemporary neuroscience now understands that there's also top-down processing from pre-existing schemas. A, a, a term that uh, Norm brought up earlier. This is um, pre-existing schemas. You know, attentive biases, pre-attentive biases. You know, uh, if 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 something is very important to you from past experience, you will in preferentially process these billions and billions of stimuli that are bombard bombarding all your sensory receptors, and you will uh, preferentially detect it in the environment, and and that's. Top-down processing from the highest order, heteromodal, very complex uh, frontal cortices and other cortices in the brain that actually feed back to very early portions of sensory processing in the receptors, not necessarily peripheral receptors, but within the brain. So from very high order centers within the brain going down to certainly secondary association areas and, and even primary association areas. So that there's a constant back and forth, a give and take between bottom up, percolating up, and then top down, uh, modifying and filtering and shaping our ongoing experience. I think it's very consistent with your work, but I think the rest of neuroscience has caught up to you. And I think we, we, we believe that now. And, and there's infinite amounts of data to support it. Uh, not only from contemporary neuroscience, but from psychology and even with Piaget. So this is going back really not only to assimilation. We don't only take in and metabolize information in a passive way. We accommodate. That's the other part of Piaget that's most important and I think was most 
uh, revolutionary about his, uh, his work was that we change in response to experience. And that changing uh, in response has reorganized the schema. So we're not the same as we were prior to that last experience. And this is true of all perceptions. So I, in, in line with the, the paper, I, I agree very much that transference is, is a, a special aspect of perception. It is a perceptual process. Uh, it probably is unique in the sense that uh, we are really social beings. And, uh, and so much of our life experience and our happiness and unhappiness is formed in social arenas. And, and social relationships have been formed. Our, our, our schema, our pre-existing schema, has come from very, very early childhood experiences in line with Dr. Brenner's comments. So I agree that, yes, transference does reflect uh, and, and conflict, the, the, the central aspects of conflict, primarily and most often are expressed through transferential relationships because our desires and wishes have been informed so early. So I think I'm, I'm more or less agreeing with everyone, but maybe elaborating it, because I think, yes, conflict is absolutely central. That's what we need to go for. And I'm also agreeing that transference is so ubiquitously important in, in uh, psychoanalytic work because it's most often the source of conflict. And, uh, and, and that both of those arenas are... are transference they're, they're is the source of conflict. Often, uh, from desires, you know, what, mm. Yes, in, in terms of ancestral aggressive wishes that you mentioned, and most of those, I think, are generated within social domains. I would say expression of conflict. Okay, that's good. Formed by conflict. Yeah, I'll, uh, per, well, perhaps, perhaps. Um, I, I'm willing to, to say that's possible and probably right. I think aggression can also be a consequence of uh, frustrated wish, for example, that have been established by my pre-existing schema of what I want from the next person I meet, um, and and that that uh, that that wish from the next person I meet has been informed my, by my prior experience and often very early uh, prior I've done experience. The frustration and aggression. Now. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but, but I just want to, Brad, one thing though, about, and this is, I guess, one thing I struggled with in the paper. Um, you know, psychoanalysts often are trying to map their idiosyncratic concepts on other, conce on other concepts, and there's some mapping of transference onto the notion of perception, for sure, and perception and memory have already been mapped together by some neuroscientists like Edelman, and I think Dr. Modell has showed that those are very close together. But th it seems to me that there's a problem in <coughs> tying in transference to perception too closely and to this notion, because you see the transferences that are of most interest to psychoanalysts are the ones that don't accommodate. Absolutely. Um, and so I think the, the issue is, it, once we start to talk about transference as this general, is this ubiquitous way of perceiving the world uh, that's going on unconsciously, and adapting to the world and modifying the world, then we have the big problem is the patients often come for treatment because they have recalcitrant transferences that are not adapting. Right. Um, and so how do, you under, how do you understand why that's happening if it's just a core perceptual process? Well, we, well yeah. In other words, I, I, I'm happy to answer it from our, our viewpoint from the paper, but if you're asking it of Brad, that's fine as well. Anybody? I mean, I, I, we struggled with this a good bit because we wanted to establish that it is a core perceptual process that's ubiquitous. And in doing so, though, it does water down the stickiness that we experience clinically uh, and the truncated versions of, of what we get in our cl uh, clinical practices. And. Uh, so there, there is a, a big difference, and we didn't want to dilute the clinical uh, phenomenon with the more ubiqu ubiquitous one, but rather that it is a, more of a special case and one in which we also have the opportunity to observe in the clinical situation, which we otherwise don't observe very carefully uh, outside of the clinical situation. And so one of the things I think that's true is that there are much, much more fixity and stickiness in many, many different aspects of our lives. Don't you think another way of saying it is that 
it isn't that transference is in any way unique or special in the analytic situation. It's ubiquitous in all uh, interpersonal relationships. And that we what is what is unique about transference in the analytic situation is not its presence, but how it's dealt with. That is to say, the second person tries to analyze and understand. That's not the way... In, in the rest of life. In, in Absolutely. But I, I, I do think that you're, you're right that um, in many ways, in, in fact, we, we discover transfer, not we, uh, you know, others discover transference because of its pathological manifestations. This is true in many, many areas and domains of medical science. Right? We, we learn about normal function through pathology. Not always, but that's often what you... When things are working right, you don't see them, you don't notice it. And, and so this is ubiquitous, and, and most often it does come to clinical attention when it's not properly flexible, where there, when there's an inflexibility, a failure to accommodate to external uh, input and reality in a way that's adaptive. So if someone, you know, for every single person, every single male they meet sees, you know, a, a, an abusive, harsh, uh, demeaning father, that's um, pathological in, in the sense that it's not helping their lives, it's making them un unhappy. That's still transference in, in, in the wide sense, but it's, it's, uh, it's not sufficiently flexible and accommodating. Mm -hmm. And I think that's often the case in pathological systems, neural systems, is that you lose a, a uh, degrees of freedom. You lose flexibility in the functioning of the, those neural systems, and that's what I think is happening with transference. Now, the problem with that, obviously, is that it makes people unhappy, but it, often it's, it's uh, generated as a, as, it's a motiv motivated um, inflexibility. It's generated by fear. It's, uh, it's a defense. Um, you know, and, and it's generated, and it is associated with conflict because you both want that person to be the father and to undo the, the traumas that have happened, and at the same time, you avoid that person or react as though they're going to traumatize you again. I mean, I, you know, you can, we, we all know how that plays out clinically, but I think that that's another way in which the conflict um, enters when, when this system is sufficiently inflexible and pathological. And it's in its inflexibility, uh, we try to use motor descriptions and Parkinsonian-like kinds of things. And in terms of uh, dynamic modeling, we talked about fixed point attractors and things like that uh, as ways of trying to describe what is otherwise a much more flexible kind of behavior or flexible anticipations as to contrast that with things that are much more rigidifi rigidified and, and, and strictured in some kind of way. And I think that the analytic situation takes advantage both in our ability to observe and interpret and to participate in it in some way that we don't otherwise have that capability of doing. I, you're, I, trying I, to, you're saying, which I think is absolutely right, that there's a a great danger in analogizing thinking, thought, with motor behavior. Mm -hmm. I agree. It's, it's, it's not a... It's Calling it inflexible. It, that doesn't describe thinking. No, it doesn't. It, but it's a, it's it's a, a way, way of capturing of the, the restriction to it. One of the things, uh, Arnie, were you going to say something? Because I wanted to get to the point about consciousness of transference or the potential consciousness of transferential processes that is a very lively topic <clears throat> amongst many people. And uh, though, Arnie, were you going to say something at this well, point? Well, I'm going to say, I think what we ought to keep in mind is, uh, is I guess the audience hasn't read this paper, but I think Walter makes a very important point, which, which we made use of, and that's the distinction between sensation and, and uh, a perception. Uh, my take on it would be is that the fixity of transference has to do with the lack of freedom of, of, of interpretation of meaning. And we haven't, we haven't used the term meaning in this discussion. Uh, but Walter, uh, he have to talk, to, he, he'll, he'll, he'll tell us, but he, uh, he, he, he has observed with his, with, with, with his rabbits that the s sensation in the nose is uh, 
uh, undone, as it were. I mean, the best, that, 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 that may, may, may not be the best word, but uh, it's um, uh, negated in a certain sense. Mm. And uh, Walter's uh, <laughs> re research comes very close to Freud's discussion of the mystic uh, writing mm -hmm. pad. Uh, if you remember this paper where uh, Freud posits uh, that there, uh, that the uh, the uh, incoming percepts are, um, are are wiped out, uh, wiped clean, uh, wiped clean. Yes. Well, that's not quite what I got. It, it is um, it, uh, well, <laughs> let to say. because let's say there is, uh, let's say some form. Some uh, entity in the environment which now impacts on the individual and the receptors. All that the receptors get is molecules of scent, photons, phonons, <coughs> vibration at the atomic level, which they then convert into trains of action potentials at the, at the cellular level. Where there is a synthesis of a percept now is in cortex, after there has been a transmission of this activity driven by the, let's say, external percept, if we don't know what it is, it's the ding on sich, the Dasein, it's whatever it is, we now have had past experience with this, presumably. If it's the first time, okay, that takes a different path. But let's say, granted, there's some past experience, then what the percept gives is the roster or the texture of the experience. At first, in each of the sensory modalities, and <clears throat> this happens simultaneously in all sensory areas, they all transmit broadly, including the entorhinal cortex. It goes through the hippocampus, comes back out to the entorhinal cortex, and goes back out all the cortices. <clears throat> what happens is most remarkable. It's the formation of a multi-sensory image pattern which involves the synchronized activity oscillations in the beta range over virtually the entire hemisphere. Now this is a real frontier area but it's essentially the direction in which the studies of perception will take us to a phenomenon which I think is an excellent candidate for consciousness. Because of the breadth of it, the flexibility, the repeated frames, this is not a continuous flow, it's cinematographic, as Oliver Sacks describes it. So this now is why the percept coming in from outside is broken down into the atomic and cellular it isn't a percept from the outside. What you're trying to talk about is the relationship between an afferent action current and thinking. All right. That's what I'm describing also. That's what you're trying to talk about. That's right. That the afferent... To say that from. that's an obscure relationship mm -hmm. is underestimating it. <laughs> the thought is now not in the initial impact in the primary sensory area. That's an ingredient. But the thought essentially comes after the multimodal fusion in line with uh, Wolfgang Kurler's. But it goes back to what, uh, let, me, let me be sure about this, but it goes back to what uh, Arnie was saying is that the sensory input only gets to the first synaptic layer. Yeah. And there it's washed away. But it and isn't synapses if you think of the retina. I mean, there are changes at the very first uh, uh, very first perceiving neuron, very first stimulated neuron, mm -hmm. and and to talk about uh, s you know brain and uh, central nervous system and peripheral nervous system is complicated <coughs> also, as I'm sure Professor Freeman would say would be the first to say. Mm -hmm. I mean the the certainly the second layer of cells in the retina is part of the brain. So is the cochlea. That's very true, 
you know, and the question, it's a complicated, very complicated The difference is that in the organization of the stimuli, they maintain their coherence only to the first synaptic layer. Well, and, I, and thereby their organization is tossed out and it is the internal gestalt that uh, uh, <laughs> takes its form it's, from there. I mean, Professor Freeman's point is one that I certainly agree with, uh -huh. that the state, whatever that means, the state of the central nervous system affects what we call perception. Right. Right. Uh, and as I said, uh, Hollo wrote about it on, you know, from psychological observations 50 years ago. Uh, there's a big difference, though, between the retina and the visual cortex. And there's a big difference between the cochlear nucleus and the auditory cortex. Well, there are the differences. The processes I'm describing take place only in cortex. That's an I'm enormous sure. amount, as you know, of pre-processing going on in the visual, auditory, and somatic systems. The olfactory system, by contrast, is rock bottom simple. That's why I spent so much time on it. Yeah. But uh, uh, the process that I find <coughs> in olfaction, the olfactory bulb, which is the first yeah. in that, that now occurs not in the retina, not in the cochlear nucleus. It occurs in cortex. So that's where you have the topology of connections, which give you these dramatic oscillations <coughs> that are crucial to the whole construction process. I, I don't see how anybody with a, even a medium knowledge of neurophysiology and brain physiology can dispute what you're saying. Absolutely. Uh -huh. I agree. That we've got, our problem has suddenly evaporated. Well, if that... Oh. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't think we had a problem. I started out by saying I agree with what you say. If, if, there are certain things that you've said that I would uh, elaborate, or, but, yeah. but basically I would agree. If that's the case, and we, we don't have a problem anymore... Uh, well, that's got nothing to do with transference, though. Huh? What is that to do with transference? I, I, I can say something yeah. to that. Uh, I'm, I'm, I may be taking off in my own uh, strange way, but my, my translation goes something like this. Uh, equivalent to sensation is our unconscious uh, reaction to the other person's feeling states, which we then uh, create a uh, percept by, by, by in, interpreting it. All right. You're looking, uh, you're looking at me as if a reaction to a feeling state. We, as analysts, pick up. I, I can give you a a, a, a a example of transference that occurred quite recently in my practice. A very commonplace, simple-minded reaction. Uh, I, uh, my patient, was going on at great length talking about something. I didn't see the point of it, and I was getting impatient. And uh, I asked him, you know, what what did this mean? But he picked up my impatience. I'm talking about the tone of voice as a communication. Oh, it's a communication. A, a feeling state, right. Which, which, it's a communication, Arnold. It's a communication. It, it, is, it, it is a raw input, unconsciously. Unconscious input. I'm saying something very simple. Uh, I'm saying that this, this is, I take this, 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 this to be a, a, analogous to uh, a, a raw uh, input which is then uh, in, 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 uh, interpreted as a percept. When now, you my say a raw input. What does that mean? It means unconscious, an unconscious percept. Feeling the other person's feeling state is an unconscious percept, which we pick up by uh, tones of voice in psychoanalysis. But you just said that he heard your communication, your tone of voice, as saying to him. I'm impatient. Yes. That I'm conscious. No. It's a nonverbal uh, communication. Uh, it wasn't unconscious with it. Sometimes it's unconscious. Don't misunderstand yeah. me very often. But in the example you just gave is a beautiful example of com nonverbal communication. Yeah. Right? 
but in this that case, it was unconscious. Being conscious or, or unconscious. But it, it can, it, it often is unconscious. Of I, I think many times, in fact, usually, perhaps, <clears> the, uh, the, the sensory stimuli to which we, that, that, to which, that, that we're constructing as an internal experience, actively constructing, are out of awareness. Mm -hmm. So, for example, I mean, I, I have no idea that if this is relevant to the example, but let's just say that the patient is um, out of awareness, at some level intuited the impatience, but then responded as, you know, you know uh, in a uh, sort of paranoid stance, you know, you're going to attack me uh, because you're impatient with me. Well, through the analytic process, you can hopefully disentangle that and, and, and understand that the, the fear of uh, retaliation or attack comes from the perception of impatience that yes maybe I, I did I was sort of aware of that in retrospect and, and I think it gets it, it's re relevant to a point in the paper and, and something else that had come up in terms of uh, that, that Dr. Brenner mentioned in, that we work um, through conflict and that we work through transference that other people spoke of so that that's unique to psychoanalysis. Um, I, I'm not sure that entirely is because, for example, in CBT, part of CBT would be working in the moment, saying, you know, you are reacting as though I'm in, impatient, or you're and you're distorting that into a paranoid stance, as though I'm going to attack you. Um, and so that's that's the mechanism of uh, that's a modality of what operating with CBT. And I don't think that. And, and often that will occur in a sort of relationship mode with the therapist and the patient. So I don't think even that's necessarily unique to um, psychoanalysis. I think what, well, it's what is it's derived from psychoanalysis. It, well, I, I agree, but, but CBT people wouldn't say it's derived, but I agree it is. It's well, it is. I agree. <laughs> I agree. But I also don't think that it, that's necessarily the, the unique contribution of psychoanalysis. I think that... Uh, the, the contribution is really from your work and others, of, of course, looking at conflict and, and the motivation of, of uh, the, the information processing machinery that we have that will preferentially interpret things one way or another. So it may be uh, you know, a wish to make you into my you know, attacking father. Sure. That I would, sure. I would, that's why I would choose to interpret that impatience that way. And, and it's a wish that you would be my attacking father. So that's a motivated <coughs> construct. That's the unique thing. And I think that in, in good analysis, that, and obviously that's an ambivalent thing, because you're also, it's a painful experience, you know, the concern that my analyst is going to attack me. But at the same time, it's a wish that you're going to be my father. That's conflict. Compromise formation. Is exactly. Side. That's compromise formation. And that is the unique modality of, of work with psychoanalysis, in my opinion. Oh, that's, Brad, that's, I, I never said that... Oh, no, I'm, I'm elaborating, that's all. I'm not yeah. disagreeing. I only said that what's unique about transference in analysis, unique about transference in analysis, it's not the only contribution that analysts have made to understanding the mind, but what's unique about transference is the way it's dealt with. That it's analyzed. Correct. I just and, and I was elaborating, so I wasn't only saying it's say reality testing, or uh, trying to undo the distortions, or to make the cognitive you know information processing machinery more flexible or more uh, reality prone and improve reality testing. It's also getting at the motivational aspect of it and the and the function of it, which sure, is compromise formation. Of course. Formation. That's what you mean by analyzing. Correct, but I think a lot of people, perhaps, maybe I'm, maybe I'm wrong, but I think a lot of people would not view it, view the work of, many, of work in transference is that. There are many misguided people. <laughs> Their cognitive schemas <laughs> haven't quite agree with accommodated. Do you want to ask where this paper is? It will be published in Psychoanalytic Psychology October 07. Um, let, let me uh, ask if there is anything uh, f from our panelists at this point that they want to follow up with, or is it sufficiently interesting to pursue the idea about whether or not transference can become conscious? Uh, is that something that people want to take up here or not? Well, we're, we're still within the panelists. No, no, for, oh, for, you did? 
Walter, hey. did you have your hand up? Yeah, I did. Oh, go ahead. I had, uh, before you get into this imponderable question of is it or isn't it, or will it ever be conscious, I'd like to raise a more mundane question, and that is the following, that throughout human experience, particularly in primitive tribes, so-called primitive, actually they're pretty well advanced, you have remarkable ceremonies which are designed to ease the passage from childhood to adulthood. And these have well-established techniques involving communal activity, typically with vigorous dancing, exercise, chanting, rhythmic clapping, stomping. It goes on for days and nights. People to the point of exhaustion collapse. What Pavlov called transmarginal inhibition. And thereafter, during this recovery process, coming back again, that's when the crucial process takes place of bringing the person in to the tribe. There's a tribe in West Africa, for example, where a, an adolescent who collapses this way will be wrapped in a shroud and taken to the graveyard. And then, as they come back again, reawakening. So it's a clearly a symbol of rebirth. Now, but, uh, this, you know, there are, you don't have to go to West Africa. You've been to a bar mitzvah, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> Our first communion. I wasn't going to make any personal <laughs> remarks. <laughs> no, but, but it's yeah. not just, quote, primitive societies. That okay. Have, it's far that advanced have, uh, societies. That's why I corrected institutionalized, myself. Institutionalized. Uh, okay. My point is that this is a form of social engineering, yeah, sure. which is designed to bring about behavior modification of a very deep kind and a very desirable kind. You see this, in, I experienced, in hazing and fraternity, mm -hmm. where it creates a lifelong bond with the old grads, which is outside consciousness. It's uh, just, just there. It colors my behavior, even though I rebel against that kind of coloration. But my question to you now is that somehow I feel you've been tiptoeing around this question of social engineering, of the techniques that are widely used, widely practiced for behavior modification of this basic kind, which apparently are not in use in psychiatry, in psychoanalysis. And my question is, why not? Because the behavior, the modification is much less than you think. That's what psychoanalysis <laughs> or psychoanalysts have discovered. Well, you see this, let's say, in uh, teenage And hula. when somebody falls in love, for example, uh, it's not just to rupture the bond, it's to renew the bond with somebody else. Uh, it's I determined see. by what went on before, as you say. Uh, well, I'm saying that, that there is a power to these techniques, which is neglected. I would say that this is a major problem in inner cities with teenage gangs hoodlums that essentially bond to each other in circumstances where what does there's it no mean bond supervision. with each other? They form blood-related gangs. They exchange wounds. They cut each other and uh, share blood. Uh, they have rituals in which one of them has to go out and kill somebody, mm -hmm. a random choice. Mm -hmm. well, this is, you've heard of this, this kind of thing. Yeah. So this is going on in our inner cities. But it also has a sexual significance. Highly so. They all do. But that's my question oh. is that... Well, and know. that sexual significance is determined to a much greater extent than you are willing to uh, agree is determined by past experience. Yeah. yeah. Uh, actually, I want to disagree with Charles about one thing. Mm -hmm. um, so this issue as to whether there is a rupture. It's the, I'm about halfway through a book by Leonard Shengold called Haunted by Parents. And one of the things he talks about is reanalyzing people who didn't get better. Mm 
um, and finding that a number of them have formed, you know, I'm using this word internalizations, but uh, uh, identifications with or internalizations with parents who are in some ways abusive that they can't let go. So they end up repeating sadomasochistic attachments. And when they do get better, the person goes through this incredible crisis of uh, feeling like they're going to die as they detach from that internalized bond to the negative parent. Now, in the classic text on rites of passage, I mean, this idea of the shroud, the idea that you have to die to be reborn is, 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 is in most rites of passage, although I can't, I'm not sure it's in a bar mitzvah, but uh, <laughs> the, well, there are people, there are a lot, you hear a lot of complaints during bar mitzvahs, but I haven't heard that one. But in a classic rite of passage, there is some kind of sense that the old self must die for the new self to, to exist. So I think in some analyses, when there is a, a bonding with a problematic inter internal image that you can't let go of, you can't conceive of yourself with existing without that love, that as the person starts to get better, they will have dreams of things dying, people dying, catastrophes happening, etc. Obviously, I'm extrapolating, but uh, from individual cases, but this is, it seems to me, what Shengold is also documenting. And it's, of course, going on in the head. The parents could have been dead for 30 years. Mm -hmm. But I think that you're, you're onto something, again, very important, and it may be a kind of archaic representation of what happens when we go, go through vast kinds of neuronal change. That's, neuro, you know, that's neuroscience speak for what we would normally call, in analysis, mourning or giving up the attachment, etc. But this, this piecemeal thing that happens when we mourn, um, the fact that mourning is piecemeal is very interesting from a neuroscience point of view. It does seem like what has to happen is you have to bring certain neuronal networks, activate them, <coughs> pay attention to them, and then alter them. And that's what, in general, people who study plastic, plastic change find uh, when you're trying to uh, change, do, do any kind of learning. Uh, the, it requires paying concentrated attention, you know, analytically making the unconscious conscious. Talking in terms of plus, you know, neuroplasticians, it's, it's about paying very, very close attention in a repeated way until the circuit starts to change and then it starts to generalize. Uh, so it would be very interesting to start to try to map on how um, recur the kinds of myths that recur across culturally, such as you must die before you're re reborn, tie into the fundamental changes that are going on inside us biologically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Norman, I would only say I think we're thoughts to go. are biological phenomena. I feel like about a biological phenomena, too, as well, sometimes. Mm -hmm. What? And sometimes they're about biological phenomena. Of course. Yeah. Of course. But they are biological phenomena. Yeah, I'll do that. I'll say that. Okay, so I think that... Um, we're going to go to uh, our audience, and we're just not going to get to my interest in the unconscious uh, and transference. I could say and, something. And if you're going to have a question, please come up to one of the mics and introduce yourself, and uh, I, I guess uh, say where you're from, if you would. Nobody's going to answer my question. Yeah. Why, why we don't do it? <laughs> okay. Now I think I know. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Touchy. Can you hear me? Sure. Yeah. Uh, this is Dr. Oh, Melissa Wanamaker. To, um, louder. I particularly was interested in Dr. Friedman's discussion of the child dissolving the bond to the parent. To and the parent. Forming other new attachments. Yeah. Now, I just cannot see how um, it, it sounds as if. They had a bond to the parent originally. Then that died or stopped. And then they went on to a new attachment that was unrelated to the original attachment. Now, I don't understand, as I have understood transference, how that can be. Because mm -hmm. it would seem you have an either or situation. Whereas it seems that in the usual perception of transference, the, the original connection is carried forward in future relationships. It's, it's different, and yet it bears enough of the sameness that um, it may be healthy or it may be unhealthy. 
And the patient brings that to the analytic situation and through transference they form a bond with the analyst which is then interpreted and um, mostly patients bring unhealthy new connections and relationships to their sessions mm -hmm. which are interpreted and ultimately after a long period of time usually it seems that uh, there comes to be an understanding of the nature of those relationships and how they're based on the original ones well, so you're... that nothing has died, there is no dissolving of a bond, ah. and I don't see, I cannot understand your work basically, which you described earlier, in which you said there was a dissolving of this bond. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. I think that... So I have a big difference, it seems, if I, be if I, have, if I believe you, then that means I can't believe as I do about transference. The, the, the two seem to be... Um, Self-defeating. They don't go with each other, as I understand you. Uh -huh. Okay. Thank you. Very Thank you. Much. Go ahead. Oh yes. Well, the question of dissolution is multi-levels. At some levels, where there's been enormous conflict between parent and child to begin with, then the adoption of a new love object can result in even permanent. Dissolution, but in most instances there is a transient period where the girl is telling the father, "Papa, don't preach," and attempting to maintain some contact with her parents, but not controlling, not allowing them to control. So I think there's all different grades of dissolution, and what I'm really pressing for most clearly is the phenomenon of the loss of prior structure. Now there's an excellent biological example of this in the multiparous sheep. That is to say, not with the first litter, but the second litter. The dam now will kick away the yearling if they come and try to nurse, meaning that the olfactory imprint for that yearling has been dissolved. It's gone. That no longer belongs to her. So that is a stark, simple, elementary kind of example. And I don't think that that, by any means, can be stretched to accommodate phenomena, certainly not with my children. <laughs> but but I, I, I have to, I, 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 I'm sorry, I have to take a little bit of issue. It's not a loss of all structure. It, it's, a re, it's, it's a restructuring. Because it's very clear that if, at least from lots of animal research and even from, you know, uh, horrific, uh, you know, the, the Romanian uh, orphan situation, that if, if attachments and relationships aren't established early, these, yeah. these relational schema are not established, uh -huh. that you don't have the capacity to attach and form relationships later. I have no quarrel, no so, disagreement. But so, so, so the point is that at least you have to have something has to remain or you wouldn't go on to make a new attachment. So it's reworked, I think, just by, yeah. by definition. It has to yeah. be. It's not a loss of, of yeah, all in, structure. In fact, the classic picture of people undergoing religious conversion is that they walk down the aisle on their knees and then collapse at the altar. And then as they come back out again, most of their structure returns. Only a small part of this. But that small part now essentially is a new kind of allegiance. Right. So that's what I'm describing. Yeah. Jock. Yes, uh, uh, this is Jock Panksepp. Uh, I think the one point of agreement clearly that hasn't been discussed very much is that the most interesting aspect of transference is emotional. And uh, that is the issue that really comes to prominence in psychoanalysis psychoanalytic situations and as Brad Peterson said uh, if things are going well you don't notice it it's only the bad ones that have to come and be resolved or brought into cognitive awareness but the dilemma is that these affects are in a primitive form of consciousness uh, 
uh, they are felt, but you don't know why you're feeling them, and uh, the therapeutic situation brings them into cognitive awareness, hopefully in the correct way. So, you know, maybe people want to elaborate on that a little bit. Uh, but uh, even though there might be agreement on the emotional issues, I, I've got one disagreement with you, Walter, even though your vision of amnesia, I think, has an important part in the whole process of rebonding. Uh, what we do in neuroscience, or what people who are consumers of neuroscience do, is they grab on to the most salient, popular uh, fact. And oxytocin in bonding is the current meme. It is not necessarily the most important aspect of bonding. Uh, since I've been there at the very beginning, and we generated the first neuroscientific hypothesis of bonding, it came from the available neurochemical system in 1972, which were opioids. And I do believe the evidence still indicates that opioids are more powerful in bonding than oxytocin. And oxytocin really wouldn't do anything unless it interacted with opioids. There's also dopamine for sexual bonding. And uh, then there's that mysterious prolactin in the background that no one has studied fully, but it's very powerful in modulating the emotions that are necessary for bonding. So uh, please wipe from your memories, if you possibly can, the meme that oxytocin erases the slate, unless Walter will correct me with data as opposed to... <laughs> as opposed to hypotheses. So let's go back in history when people were uh, independent of this kind of neuroscience. And you go back to Homer's Odyssey, and Helen of Troy has been returned after the wars. And uh, the most famous of the warriors has now come back, Odysseus. And Helen decides that she will throw a celebration for the lost warriors, especially Odysseus. And uh, everyone congregates. And after the conviviality wanes, people start talking about Odysseus and the other lost warriors. And everyone gets sad. And the party goes down the tubes. And Helen, of course, is highly distressed by this situation, so she decides she has to solve it pharmacologically. <laughs> and uh, she slips into the wine an anodyne, as it was described by Homer, the sweet magic of forgetfulness, which Walter was talking about. And of course, now ethnopharmacologists want to know what was this sweet magic of forgetfulness? <laughs> They only have three options. One was alcohol, and there was already plenty in the system. <laughs> it's a funny form of forgetfulness. Then there were uh, opioids. And the only other option was? GHB. <laughs> you only wish. Cannabis. Cannabis. <laughs> and uh, if you take these, the high probability is that Helen put opioid, tincture of opium, because that takes away sorrow. It melts sorrow. And when you melt sorrow, you open up your mind to new associations. Mm. But uh, we do not have this kind of data from oxytocin, except a little bit of human data suggesting the cognitive apparatus gets a little dull. Not necessarily forgetful, but dull. I'm sorry if I'm taking so long. No, 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 that uh, was not my point. Yeah, uh, <laughs> David and I now are doing some oxytocin experiments. And because of your hypothesis, we're going to inject that into the study. Uh, <clears throat> I have done so much oxytocin work uh, in my life. And uh, you know, it's an impressive molecule, an impressive molecule of bonding, as are opioids on the, and those other ones. but. If you're really looking for the sweet magic or forgetfulness that opioids can do for all the negative memories, but it's a temporary anodyne, a temporary solution, there's even a better one. And that better one is cannabis, the third alternative. What modern neuroscience has dramatically demonstrated is that anyone 
who's been high knows your cognitive apparatus goes to hell <laughs> at a high enough dose. You can't remember anymore. You literally, one moment, have an experience. The next moment, you're wondering what that experience was. Mm -hmm. Cannabinoids are massively amnesic. So I would probably reformulate the hypothesis that's so intriguing from Walter that essentially what happens when you have to make a new bond is that cannabinoids, a molecule of momentary joy, you know, allows the passage to a deeper and newer joy, a newer bond. So, any thoughts? Okay, I want to, Walter, uh, Walter, I wanted Walter to respond and then I wanted to say something after Walter. Okay, good, yeah, I'll be brief. Essentially, uh, I strongly object to your characterizing uh, this process as amnestic, a forgetting. It's not. It's, uh, no. I am not, you know, against the idea of the value of a good forgettery. In fact, it's far better to have a good forgettery than a good memory, because I'm sure you psychiatrists all know there's far more people in mental hospitals because they can't forget than because they can't remember, and there just isn't enough research. The process improves every year. That's right. Okay. Yeah, something that solves it. It solves itself, right? But I have utterly great respect for your many experiments in oxytocin. I thought you should have been on this, this panel to begin with, and I'm trespassing on your turf even to talk about it at all. What data are you basing your oxytocin idea on? That is a question. Oh, this is the uh, work on uh, bonding uh, described in the uh, 1980s and 90s. Uh, essentially, by um, Heinrich. Uh, what's the name? The guy that. that uh, Insel. 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 Yeah. Insel yeah. was in the 90s. About forgetting. I know. No. That's right. It wasn't forgetting. That's my point. And that you're well, confusing the issue by introducing forgetting oh, okay. as the process, which I say they don't oh. forget. St. Paul remembered clearly after his conversion experience. Well, 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 but part of the problem was that cognitive neuroscientists. <laughs> did the lion's share of the oxytocin research, and they were paying attention to attention, memory, and concentration. And those are pretty poor measures of forgetting if you're thinking about becoming more involved in something than... Uh, um, so, so uh, in fact, we, we, th there's a recent uh, study that just came out on uh, oxytocin in autism, and uh, Kids who were in, and adults with Asperger's and autism who were given four hour infusions of oxytocin did really poorly on word memory tests and their, uh, their learning skills on, on, on social communication and eye contact and all of that stuff went through the roof. So it depends. Meaning through the roof and Through the roof, positively. So it's a, it's a bias as to who was doing the, and what the measures were is in part. I just wanted to say about the reconciling between the, the peptides of the oxytocin and the opioids and having something to do with education as well as transference and what I've learned from both Walter and from Yacht through the years is that the research that I'm starting to undertake is, has to do with both of those peptide systems, the oxytocin and the peptides, and, and how they play into what, for be lack of better words, is attachment. But by attachment, I mean the way we find ourselves through others in the world. And that is also a letting go of where we were before and finding what we find new. And those are the things that I'm most curious about. Yes, sir. Uh, hello. Uh, my name is David Hecht. I study cognitive science. and. Um, I wanted to address the, the question that Dr. Freeman raised uh, just before we went to questions, which was the idea of social engineering and behavior modification. Um, and I'm glad he mentioned twice now the conversion experience. Um, and uh, it strikes me that this is an example of a very extreme sort of shift between attachment to one set of beliefs and social structures that is now restructured in a, some dimension to create a, some significant variation in, in a person's daily activity. Um, and what I think um, Dr. Freeman was getting at was that uh, could these techniques, the, the vast difference that you see before and after such an experience and the, the process by which this occurs, and obviously there's a lot of um, 
talk we could do about the brain states involved, but I'm just curious if um, there's any notion of whether these sorts of techniques, and of course they come in in less uh, auspicious settings, brainwashing and interrogation, but if these techniques have any role in psychiatry and in psychotherapy, if there's an ethical basis for them, and if there's a way to empirically validate these kind of uh, techniques such that we can use them to take advantage of neuroplasticity and behavior modification. Well, that's what Walter was bringing up before, is asking that question as to whether they can be more directly involved. Yeah. I guess there's a question. You know, I mean, how, how much of a role does suggestion play in everyday therapeutic work, whether it's psychoanalytic or, or other? And certainly, I think that's akin to a lot of these sorts of uh, experiences, right? Yeah. And certainly. You know, hypnosis is the, the, uh, the prototype of, of a suggestive therapy, and we know that's, you know, that uh, relationship to analysis. In fact, the analytic, for those who aren't analysts, you know, the analytic situation of being on, you know, the analyst behind the patient and patient on their back came from hypnotic technique um, that Freud originally used. So mm -hmm. I, I, I think some of these things, like it or not, do permeate our work. I think the best example of, uh, just one sec, Norm, the best example of how uh, we socialize our patients and how they socialize us actively is the gestures we make and how they start gesturing at the same moment we do or they, we pick up their gestures and we never really talk about it usually, but it's all going on all the time. Uh, Norm, let me go to Mark for one second then come back to you. Thanks. Um, so I'm Mark Solms, and um, for my sins over the last few years, I've been burdened with uh, tra translating Freud's writings, so I understand them very, very well. And the concept we are discussing is transference, which is a Freudian concept, and I feel duty-bound to say something from the Freudian point of view, uh, which I think has been missing in the discussion. Um, and you wanted to um, address the question, David, about conscious and unconscious, uh, and prob probably you would have got to it, but so I, I just sort of feel in case we don't get to it, uh, I, thank I, you. I really I have to, to say there. something. <laughs> uh, it, it you touches, are my plant. <laughs> it touches on uh, some of the issues you did discuss, um, but the, 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 I think that the, 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 the overall area um, that you have been discussing is not something that's uniquely Freudian. It's something that Freud was well aware of it, pre-existed uh, Freud. Despite some of uh, uh, Walter Freeman's uh, comments about you know, his recent innovations, I, I really think it was implicit in, even in uh, the association psychology that, that you disparage. You know, the concept of apperception is what you're discussing. And as you say, it goes on uh, in Gestalt psychology with Kohler. Freud was very well aware of these things. He didn't take intellectual ownership of the fact that the past influences the present or that we perceive the present through the lens of the past. That's not transference. Uh, transference is a pathological phenomenon. It's a clinical phenomenon. Uh, I know that uh, Brad and, 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 and Charlie uh, referred to that, and I just want to clarify it. Um, Freud divided the broad field of uh, psychopathologies into transference neuroses, narcissistic neuroses, and psychoses. Please note, transference neurosis, a whole category of disorder. Psychoanalysis as a clinical method was designed to treat those disorders. It was designed to treat transferences. It's a very important point, you see. It's a clinical issue. Uh, the subset of the phenomena that you're talking about, that Freud identified, was that we don't only have these expectations born of early experience, which we then sort of carry through into all of our present perceptual experiences, but some of those expectations, some of those wants or whatever we might call them today, uh, are repressed. Some of our wants we don't want to know about. We, we refuse to acknowledge them. That gives them a special quality. The affective charge that Jacques spoke about, the, the, the troublesomeness of them, which makes them, which makes them pathological. We repress certain of our um, expectations, certain of our wants, certain of our past experiences that we project onto the, onto the present. And those repressions fail, so then that attempt to, the, the, where, the, where the want wants to come out, what representation it wants to attach itself to, it's not allowed to, so it 
transfers itself onto another one. And that's critical to symptom formation. That's how, how transference neuroses symptoms are formed. The want gets transferred onto something else and it looks very bizarre. And it has a compulsive power because it's repressed, because you will not recognize this comes from my past. I won't remember it. Forgetting, therefore, is central to transference. I won't remember it. That's where the affective charge comes from. That's where the compulsive, repetitive power comes from. That's why it's troublesome. That's why analysis, in the classical sense, has to interpret that, link it to the past experience, bring it into consciousness, which uh, is what the treatment's all about. Whether or not we still believe that, you know, I personally am quite attached to thinking like that, but whether or not we still believe that, that is the concept of transference. There were a couple things. Uh, from a dynamic standpoint, it explains the inherent unconsciousness of transference. From our model of perception and our generalized model of, of transference, it's unconscious because we, in the construction of perceptions, we are never conscious of the construction of those perceptions. Part of the problem with Freud's writing, and Arnie and I spent a lot of time with this, is that he wrote so, so little about transference throughout his writing. And it changed when he wrote about it. It, 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 it changed quite a bit. And in, I think it was in 36, or I don't know which quote it was, from the 20s or 30s, in the paper where uh, he said that the, the, about the ubiquity of transference. And uh, he moved gradually towards the position that we feel like is in keeping with our argument. From a dynamic standpoint, I agree with you that, that those are the reasons why it can never be conscious. From our model neurobiologically, we argue for a different reason, and that reason being that no percept can be conscious in terms of its construction. No, but, but from Freud's point of view, those would be descriptive unconscious processes. He wouldn't have called them transferences. Transferences are dynamically repressed object attachments which then burst through in the wrong place. They're transferred with compulsive, repetitive, affective power. Except I'll find you that yeah. quote in the 30s. This is directed to uh, Mr. Deutsch. The brain that changes itself. Uh, you can have all the repressive symptoms or whatever that you have, and you don't know, I would guess, what they are. And yet the brain still can change itself and develop itself to make one different than one was before due to all these other experiences that one has. And also if one is repetitive enough, as you said, one can actually develop new learnings that can move you to a different state and to a much more developed state. So with, that with all your repressions, your neurotic repressions or whatever, you can actually become healthier while still maintaining some of these repressions. Could you, uh, I don't know what that, what that book is about, but it's very, um, it's an optimistic book, it sounds like, from the title. You've got to summarize the book. And from my book. experience also. Um, well, I, I'm not sure exactly what the question is. Um, but, uh, the book's about brain plasticity, and I make very clear in, in the book uh, but which, by the way, in some ways Freud was a forerunner of that idea because he was in the project talked about how can the law, law of association by simultaneity, arguing that basically what we now call neurons increase their connections when learning occurs. And so it changes itself in some way or other through thinking and consciousness. But brain plasticity can lead to flexibility. And the book, if you're asking, is about all the ways the unexpected ways in which brains reorganize themselves uh, after strokes, uh, kids with learning disabilities getting over them in the therapies that work, and so on. But the, the plastic brain turns out to be both more resilient than we thought the brain to be for the last 400 years, but it also turns out to be more vulnerable. And even though the brain is plastic, it's plastic because nervous tissue works by changing its structure. Um, it's also a habit-forming machine, and our innate human brain plasticity can give rise to behaviors which are either flexible or more rigid. Okay, so uh, when people uh, get stuck in habits, that's not a sign that the, the 
the brain itself lacks this fundamental property of plasticity, that's actually an expression of plasticity. Uh, because once networks get established, they tend to be self-sustaining in the brain. Norm, you were also going to respond to something earlier, and I never got back to it. <coughs> Can't remember what it was. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Yes, please. Uh, I'm Laura Tessman from the Boston Psychoanalytic Institute. Uh, first, I want to say how grateful I am for this fun and fascinating discussion. Uh, I want to add a comment or an example about the question of fostering change, which I, which I think is in line with uh, much of what Walter Freeman has talked about. Uh, some years ago, I did a study of psychoanalysts, uh, interviewing them very intensively about the change. There's a change. <laughs> about the changes in their own experience of their analysts over time after termination. And out of a sample of 34, there were six who had experienced an extremely passionate, erotic transference and then lingering feelings toward their analysts. And they described that period in their analysis as the most powerful period of mutative change. And what seemed to be happening was a collision between past transference expectations and an openness to new experience. And what was essential at that point uh, was not um, only or not primarily the matter of interpretations, but something about the actuality of the analyst as they perceived it and the possibilities in the analyst for being a um, figure with whom a kind of not just attachment interest or attachment um, intimacy, but where they could risk the most erotic and passionate feelings from past and in the present, and where that could be safely done. It was also true that that was a time of extreme vulnerability, and uh, some of them, particularly the men who were analyzed in the 60s, when um, uh, male, male relationships were quite different from now and who tended to experience um, indifference or a rejecting of their uh, longings toward the analyst, uh, that could be extremely damaging uh, for a long time to come. Uh, so. I have no knowledge about oxytocin, but think what is actually in the room uh, is very important uh, as far as fostering or stymieing change when possible. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Hmm. I would say this. Uh, raises a touchy question. A little louder. Okay. That's good. Um, with you. This raises the touchy question about uh, the <coughs> relations of analysts to their patients in the sexual arena, <coughs> which uh, is uh, fraught with immense complications, not only legal and ethical, but uh, physical. Now. I think it's very clear that oxytocin is, in fact, involved with the reproductive process, not merely peripheral, as we've known for over 100 years, and as mammals have practiced now for 80 million years, but also the significant changes inside the brain. That's new and still poorly understood, and certainly the opiates are involved with this. <coughs> 
but it's quite clear that the release of oxytocin is strongly related to sexual intercourse and orgasm in both males and females of humans and other animals. And so intrinsically, if transference is related to this process, which I think it is, you have to face this complication head on to recognize that your patients now are in this, as she described it, vulnerable state, but so is the therapist. And in fact, if he or she becomes terrorized by the threat, it's very obvious. It appears to me that we are on very delicate ground here in proposing this connection between transference and the fundamental processes of uh, of bonding in reproduction. So I don't have any answers. I'm just raising this issue. Maybe you want to address that. Very indirectly. <laughs> Although a, a little bit. I actually wanted to introduce yourself. Oh, I'm Bonnie Smolin, also from the Boston Psychoanalytic. And I wanted to amplify something Mark said and then touch on the dispute, at, oh, that may be too strong a word, between the two of you, and, and indirectly, I think it does bear on your question. The, going back to the Freudian perception of transference, um, what, he, what he proposed in those early years that Mark almost got to but didn't quite complete was the notion that at some point the cause of the illness that he was trying to cure would cease to generate symptoms and produce in its place a transference neurosis. And that this transference neurosis would give him, as physician, direct access to something that in other respects would be immaterial and inaccessible to his efforts as a physician because he didn't have um, psychopharmacology in those days. And so in that sense, the transference neurosis is, a, is really a very powerful analytic tool and um, and I think I agree not to be confused with the basic mechanisms of projection distortion which are probably made use of in forming the transference distortions but aren't themselves transference phenomena in the dynamic unconscious sense which I think is what you were saying but the the on the issue of what it came to mean to Freud over time which I think is an incredibly complicated um, subject, I would say one thing, um, which is, I, having recently reread Analysis Terminable and Interminable for the, the intermin for the interminably nth time, it really, it, my, the, the reading one gets, I think, and I don't think that I'm the only person, I might be the only one who says it this way, is that he shifted over the course of his life from believing that the most powerful theory of mind that he could write would be one in which he could explain how one could cure a neurosis or a neurotic symptom, that this was a key into some, into a, potentially a very full understanding of the mind, and came to much more think that the most powerful theory he could ever write would be the one that would explain why you couldn't cure it, or how people mostly don't change, rather than how people mostly could change. And he, he was far less optimistic, and in that sense, I think his view my, I think his view of what is left over Optimistic of the person after you psychotic. subtract the neurosis or the neurotic the symptom and therefore what tra how, how transference might fill a person's subjectivity beyond what we think of as a transference symptom or a transference neurosis became much more um, complex and, uh, and I think at the end of his life unresolved, which is why you could read I think that paper in a somewhat different way than Mark was okay. talking about the early work. I, I don't actually think fundamentally he really changed his mind, but I, I think the language and the approach was in some way more complex. We have uh, five minutes and uh, we have no more questions from the audience. Shall we call it? Or wait, 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 we have one more. If I followed some of this, my name is Steve, there are three challenges to psychoanalysis, I think, that were put out. The last one, Freud's 
change of opinion from, from curative to why it's not being cured. And uh, the issues that you raised of uh, both the sexual danger and um, the, uh, the, the means of change, you know, the reference to uh, societies that have initiation rituals. So those three things seem to be strong uh, uh, challenges to psychoanalysis uh, in terms of transference, why use the transference? Is this simply historical? Is this an accident of, or was this a wisdom of Freud, or et cetera, that it got started to uh, opening to, uh, there's been a lot of work in, you know, over the years in, in terms of breathing, in terms of stress reduction, relaxation, meditation, which would, I think, work on a very basic, brain level of, of alteration as well as some kind of resonance uh, on all these other levels so that one would have an alternative to what might be then seen as the trap of transference mm -hmm. to run through that whole long history to see if you can dissolve or not dissolve or if you're going to end up like Freud that you, it doesn't dissolve to these alternative approaches. So I think there, there's a challenge that's very strong that's emerged uh, in the discussion that's not discussed, that's not being discussed, that's been heard maybe, but overlooked. We'll have to take it up in our next, in our nec in our next paper. All right. Thank you all.